I'm Emer and welcome to my talk, which is entitled Of Blockheads and Gatekeepers, The Secret History of Classical Tourism. I'm going to be looking through some of my PhD research about the interests women in 18th and 19th century Britain and Ireland had in traveling to Italy and recounting the tales of what they had seen there. The 18th century was uh, the period of the Grand Tour. What's the Grand Tour? It was um, the time when recently graduated young men went to Europe to look at classical sites, gain some interest in other cultures, and generally improve their intellectualism. It was almost the proto gap year before the gap year even existed. The Grand Tour was hugely influential. Not only was increased travel to Europe pretty popular, but it also allowed for the exchange of ideas and culture architectural fashion and fashion styles were imported back into Britain and Ireland on the participants return home, as well as literal ancient artifacts as well. However, the influence of the Grand Tour did not end there. Academic and learned societies, such as the Society of the Antiquaries and the Society of the Dilettanti, were made up of members um, from those who had been abroad. The Society of the Dilettanti, founded in 1735, was nominally a society to encourage the study and appreciation of ancient Greek and Roman art. However, early on in its life, it drew criticism from all circles. Notably, the writer Horace Walpole said that it was a club for which the nominal qualification was having been in Italy and the real, and the real one being drunk. The two chiefs are Lord Middlesex and Sir Francis, Francis Dashwood, who were seldom sober the whole time they were in Italy. The environment of the Grand Tour, which carried on over to these learned societies, was ostensibly one which was designed for participation by elite white men and no one else. Societies such as uh, the antiquaries and the dilettanti, however, also had a role as publishers. Their members, uniquely interested in recording information about the past, often published formal guides to archaeological sites and museum catalogues and other works of art criticism. However, this was far from the only way for people to access information about ancient visual culture. And indeed, it was arguably much less widespread than its primary counterpart, that of travel literature. In the 18th century, travel literature was also turning into something of a genre, where those who had been abroad could write up their experiences and accounts of what they had seen there. The language used by travel writers tends to be less academic and more conversational. The descriptions of artworks and archaeological sites is shorter, less overly detailed than it would be in an academic publication. Instead, the focus tended to be upon individual reactions to pieces of art, although there is also plenty of room to incorporate important historical information as well. Though early on in the 18th century, travel literature was again limited to upper class men who had recently come back from their grand tours, as the century drew on, the genre attracted a wider range of writers. The grand tour was, to say the least, a little more complicated for women than it was for men. Throughout the 18th century, women increasingly participated in travel, though this was often to accompany their husbands or their families. It was, in fact, through the legitimizing efforts of several married women that travel literature came to be established as, as a genre in its own right, and one in which women showed particular interest. Mary Wortley Montague, for example, was, is often called the first significant female travel writer while accompanying her husband to Ottoman Turkey, where he was the British ambassador, Montague used her position as a woman to highlight the value of different perspectives on travel. For example, she was able to access single sex spaces such as the Ottoman baths, which gave her travel work something that her male contemporaries couldn't match. But by the 1780s, a number of other women, such as Elizabeth Craven, Anna Riggs Miller and Hester Piozzi, had also published successfully in the genre. Increasingly, women planned for and financed their own trips abroad, either with their families, in groups with other women, or even alone. These works were really successful among men and women. The architect Sir John Stone said that he would never travel without a copy of Miller's letters. But women's travel literature also drew criticism. For example, fellow travel writer John Moore said, ladies who have remained some time at Rome and Florence 
acquire an intrepidity and a, a cool minuteness in examining and criticizing naked figures, which is unknown to those who have never passed the Alps. John Moore, it must be said, was much less successful than many of his female counterparts. While we see that some male critics had nothing good to say about women's travel writing, the same actually often applied in reverse. Pioneer travel writer Mary Wortley Montague called grand tourists the worst company in the world and the greatest blockheads in nature. Their whole business abroad, as far as I can perceive, being to buy new clothes and after the important conquest of some waiting gentlewoman of an opera queen, return to England excellent judges of men and manners. Similarly, in a more domestic sphere, Hester Piozzi expressed her relief that Samuel Johnson, although he was a friend of hers, had departed her house in Italy. I shall let loose, however, in this journey, the fondness for painting, which I was forced to suppress while Dr. Johnson lived with me and ridiculed my taste of an art his own imperfect sight hindered him from enjoying. This crops up again later in the 19th century. Um, notably in Harriet Campbell's travel diary. Harriet Campbell um, kept this diary when she was just 14 and it was never intended to be published. It's the account of her travels from France to Florence, where her mother had decided to settle for financial reasons. She intends for it to be a much longer narrative, but it's cut short when her mother announces that she is going to remarry and relocate the family to Naples. Harriet, happy in Florence and the expat British community of artists and intellectual women that she'd found there, was taken aback by the news and was too upset to continue the narrative. What does emerge from Harriet's diary, however, is an impression of a young girl who's developing a keen sense of an interest in art and whose mother gives her ample opportunity to indulge this. This anecdote is uh, here describes Harriet Campbell's encounter with a gatekeeping individual. She says, at three, I went with Mama to the Palazzo Brera. Before we set off, the Laquais de Place, Antonio, begged pardon for the liberty, but told Mama that the collection of statues at the palace were not proper for us to see. He was a blockhead for his pains. I was very provoked at him. Mama laughed heartily, but not to scandalise him, we did not ask to see them. Amongst the paintings, I cannot say there were any which struck me particularly. What's it? so interesting about this anecdote is uh, Har Harriet's outrage that she can't see these statues that she knows are there and which she's being prevented um, from seeing by someone who, you know, she doesn't think it's his place to say so. The indignant language that she uses continues on to the end where it ends up ruining her whole museum visit. The reuse of this word blockhead for someone who's gatekeeping access to antiquities is, I think, a really interesting echo to Mary Wortley Montague's earlier use of the phrase. I want to turn now to three influential travel writers, Anna Riggs Miller, Catherine Wilmot and Eleanor Cavanaugh, to um, have a think about how class and gatekeeping play a role in their accounts of travel. Perhaps the most emblematic of all the travel writers I'll be talking about today is Anna Riggs Miller. She wrote a hugely successful two volume series of letters, Letters from Italy. Um, she took this trip to Italy after she and her husband John had moved to the continent during the 1770s for financial reasons. This type of move, also taken by Harriet Campbell's mother, was not uncommon. The letters were ostensibly not written with publication in mind, but this was a common self-deprecatory tactic for women's writing, claiming that they never had any intention to publish the work when really the work shows every sign of being very carefully prepared for this purpose. Although they were initially published anonymously, the writer was quickly revealed to be Miller. Miller was a known eccentric, and she's frequently mentioned by intellectuals of the time like Horace Walpole and Fanny Burney, who claimed to find her amusing, but ultimately tasteless and a bit gauche. Fanny Burney called her a round, plump, coarse looking dame of about 40. And while all her aim is to appear an elegant woman of fashion, all her success is to seem an ordinary woman in very common life with fine clothes on. Horace Walpole said, the poor Arcadian patroness does not spell one word of French or Italian right through her three volumes of travel. 
It's not uh, difficult, really, to compare the classist nature of these remarks with Miller's very real desire to open up the experience of viewing classical antiquities to everyone. Miller sets out in the advertisement for her book what her purpose was in writing it. She mentions that many guides and catalogues to Italian antiquities and art objects exist, but that uh, these often had a double motive to encourage tourists to buy. She wanted to create a guide to Italian art that was written for someone who wanted to view and appreciate fine art, not necessarily participate in its commercial aspects. Um, she said of catalogues indeed there is no deficiency but these publications are merely catalogues such criticisms as they offer being oftentimes fortuitous frequently false and for the greater number calculated by the proprietor to promote the sale of such pictures of indifferent merit as he wishes to part with to advantage and profit the same kind of uh, sentiment pops up again throughout the narrative uh, miller is is uh, unashamed at criticizing previous travel writers who had written successful guides themselves, especially Lalonde. She says, I am sorry to find so frequent occasion to criticize Lalonde, but one is under a kind of necessity to expose such gross mistakes. He observes upon and commands modern statues and busters for antique and vice versa. Similarly, um, she is also critical of practices that keep her from seeing the artworks that she wants to see, even though she was visiting with her husband. She describes one such anecdote at Naples. There are two small rooms which are kept locked by the king's order, and very great is the difficulty of gaining the entrance of these mysterious cabinets. Decency is the pretext. A sight of these pictures, as supposed by the king, may be of dangerous consequence to young people, the most ridiculous prudery. But to return to the contents of these dangerous cabinets. And then she goes on. I really appreciate the sarcastic tone in which she um, puts forth this criticism. It's not something you often find in academic works, but it's very refreshing. Travel literature encompasses many different things, published work as well as that which was never intended to be published. The travel writings of Catherine Wilmot comprise diaries and letters between Catherine, her eight siblings and their parents, as well as members of her extended family. They were never intended to be made public and published editions only appeared in the 20th century. The family was clearly close and they spoke freely with one another. It's this openness that gives their writing an immediacy and a degree of honesty that's not often represented in published work, especially that by women. Catherine never mentions other travel literature in her narrative, but she's clearly aware of it. Very strikingly, she makes many disparaging comments upon the artworks that she sees abroad as though she's already overly familiar with them, experiencing what we might now call Paris syndrome. She addresses the letters to an unnamed recipient, though it seems likely that it was one of her brothers. She frequently nods to his greater knowledge in matters to do with art, culture and history. It's not, however, his greater knowledge that is most significant, but his greater interest. Uh, she's not always being self-deprecating when she claims these things. In many instances, it comes across very earnestly. For example, she says that at the Louvre, he, he's familiar with the antiquities there. So thank God I shall escape the operation of boring you with my comments. Besides not having the skill or the eye of an artist, I'm not qualified to do anything more than admire. Simil similarly, with Jacques-Louis David's paintings, she says, I've seen them all, but I'm not going to torment you with any description. She's very laissez-faire about the whole trip. In Rome, canonical sites of work come in for a particular criticism by Catherine. She says, I was disappointed a little in the statue of Marcus Aurelius. Um, and I'm scandalized to confess, I was also a little disappointed the first time I saw the Pantheon. However, further visits totally convinced me of its claim to the celebrity it possesses, especially when I heard performed in it one of the sweetest concerts in the world. She's very honest about what makes a viewing experience worthwhile over one that's, that's uh, more disappointing. She's critical of canonical works of art, such as the Farnese Hercules, whom she calls one of the most lubberly, preposterous wretches I ever saw in my life. Finally, I'd like to look at um, 
the work of Eleanor Cavanaugh. Eleanor Cavanaugh was Catherine's maid. She accompanied Catherine to Russia in 1805, where Catherine had been sent by her parents to fetch her sister and fellow travel writer Martha home. Eleanor had grown up around Cork with the two Wilmot girls, and this was her first time out of the country. Eleanor's impressions of life in Russia appear in two letters, which are kept as part of the Wilmot archive. By a strange turn of events, Eleanor also became the first Irish woman to have an account of a trip to Russia published, but we'll get to that later. Her encounter with the equestrian statue of Peter the Great in St. Petersburg may not involve a piece of classical art, but it, in the equestrian statue's presentation, it is harking back to that classical past. And she describes vividly the, the response that it invoked in her. I thought the screech would have choked me when turning round my head, what would I see leaping over a rail rock, but a giant of a man on the back of a dragon of a horse? I thought the life would have left me to see a live Christian making such a fool of himself. When I mean, what did I hear but that he was a marble emperor? In the published version of these letters, the editor made the choice to correct and standardize Martha and Catherine's spelling. In the original manuscripts, Catherine's spelling is apparently very erratic. This adds to the impression of Eleanor as a less intelligent observer than the two middle class girls who were staying as guests of the Princess Dashkov outside St. Petersburg. However, if we look beyond this, we find a really engaging flair for, for the dramatic, the experiential aspects of travel and seeing art abroad. The ending of the story, unfortunately, leaves a slightly sour taste in the mouth. In 1812, shortly before her marriage, Martha Wilmot showed Eleanor's letters to a friend of theirs, Maria Stanley. Maria Stanley copied them, apparently without Martha's knowledge, and sent them into the Universal magazine to be published. She introduces the letters with the following explanation. The following letters are authentic and I think highly curious. They express the native, unsophisticated feelings of an uneducated Irish girl and present an amusing instance of the impression produced by novelty upon such a mind. They contain, likewise, a great deal of the shrewd simplicity that marks the Irish character. Angela Byrne has described Eleanor's presentation in the magazine as being a precursor to that of the stereotypical Irish Bridget figure of a stupid Irish woman, usually working class and Catholic. We have no idea whether Eleanor ever found out that her words had been published. It's likely that she would have been very upset at the thought, given the care she takes within the letters to portray herself well. Maria Stanley's comments about the immediacy of Eleanor's encounters with new sites and objects are not unlike a comment that Martha Wilmot herself later made about one of her childhood friends, the Countess de Salis, saying, her manners are easy, natural, unaffected, and rather Irish, by which I mean something artless and out with it, whatever it is you're thinking, which gives an originality and almost playfulness to her manner. Although Maria Stanley meant her comments about Eleanor very cruelly, there is something attractive, for the Wilmot sisters at least, in a woman who wrote and spoke her mind in an easy, unaffected manner. And here's a short bibliography if you're interested in any of these topics. Um, to conclude, travel literature was more gender egalitarian than other genres at this point point seen as a suitable avenue for women to write in and one in which women writers found considerable success. As travel became cheaper, it became possible for a wider range of people to do it. Indeed, the work of Anna Riggs Miller was written specifically as a guide for those who could not afford to hire a real life guide to show them round sites as she herself could not. Therefore, travel literature is a way to open up classical reception narratives on gender and class grounds, both the authors and the readership were more diverse than the more scholarly works by people such as the Baron Dankerville and William Hamilton, for example. Travel literature um, is something that we could use a lot more in classics, while classical reception increasingly incorporates modern popular culture and non-traditional forms of scholarship, we still tend to think of the 18th century as a period um, in which the primary forms of classical reception and engagement was being done on the part of societies and individuals like the societies of the antiquaries and the dilettanti. The more conversational language used in travel literature, the desire to challenge canonical works of art and the criticism on them, 
as well as the discussion of the gatekeeping that existed around women who wished to view certain works of classical antiquity has um, is present in travel literature. And I hope that this has illustrated the value of using these works to open up conversations around classical reception. Thank you.